This video is going to be all about bonds, um, in particular three major types of bonds, and I'm going to try to keep it just relevant to biology because bonds obviously are going to be more of a chemistry concept. Uh, we'll start with just listing out the three types of bonds we care about um, in biology, which are going to be your ionic bond, your covalent bond, and your hydrogen bond. We'll go ahead and start with the ionic bond. So before I get into how an ionic bond works, I think it's important to first start off with the question, what is an ion? So an ion is going to be an atom that actually has a either a positive or a negative charge. And we actually have two different names for um, a negatively charged ion and a positively charged ion. Uh, a negatively charged ion is called a anion. I can usually remember like anti or like kind of sounds like a negative has a negative connotation, so I think like anions are negative, I think anti, um, and cations are positive. I remember cation because cats have paws and positive kind of rhymes or whatever. So um, what makes an ion an ion is going to be the amount of electrons that that atom has. So normally an element, if you have an equal number of protons and electrons or positive particles and negative particles, that's going to neutralize out and you're going to have a neutral atom. Now, when you have an anion, that means that that particular atom has more electrons than protons, which is going to give it an overall negative charge. And with the cations, it's obviously going to be the opposite. That means that a cation has less electrons than protons. So how does this deal with creating some sort of bond? Well, in chemistry, we know that opposites attract. So a lot of times ionic bonds are going to be formed between an anion and a cation that are attracted to each other because of those opposite charges, and that forms an ionic bond. Um, the classic example that we use is going to be how table salts formed, which I will go ahead and draw out how that works. So let's take a look at how ionic bonds work using table salt as an example, something that we all have encountered in our everyday lives. So table salt is going to be a bond between sodium, um, Na, and chlorine, Cl. So the way that this works is first we have to start off with two neutral atoms. We've got our sodium atom and our chlorine atom. So what makes these atoms neutral right now is that they have the same number of protons and electrons. So sodium has an atomic number of 11, meaning it has 11 protons. Um, and as you can see, if you were to count up the little red electrons that I've drawn um, here, so these are all going to be electrons, there are 11 of those as well. So because the positive and negative particles in sodium are equal, that means that it's a neutral atom. Same thing over here with our chlorine. Chlorine has an atomic number of 17. And as you see, if you were to count up all of these electrons, there are 17 electrons, making this a neutral atom. So the way that atoms work is electrons swirl around atoms in what's called an orbital. So here I've drawn orbitals as circles around the center of the atom, which would have the protons and the neutrons. Um, and here would be your first orbital. That's the s orbital, and it actually holds a maximum of two electrons, which is why you see two electrons here and two electrons here in chlorine. Um, that's universal. It's going to apply to every single element that we know of. Um, the next orbital is the p orbital, and it holds eight, and you can see that in both sodium and chlorine, um, that p orbital is full. You can count, there's eight in each of those. So now as we extend past the p orbital, we get to the d orbital, and the d orbital also holds a maximum of eight electrons. So with your periodic trends in chemistry, um, you'll see that the more valence electrons that an element has in its outer shell, meaning how many um, electrons it has sort of um, the furthest away from the nucleus in its outer orbital, um, the more it has, the more it's going to be what's called electronegative, which means it actually pulls on electrons. So if you were to take a guess at which of these two elements is more electronegative, um, it is obviously going to be chlorine that has seven valence electrons in its outer shell. Um, sodium's going to have a pretty weak electronegativity because it only has a single electron in its outer shell. It's just got one to hold on to instead of seven. Um, the goal for, for elements is to eventually stabilize by getting a full outer orbital. Um, chlorine just needs one more electron. Sodium um, 
would either need seven more or it would need to lose this outer electron here. So um, chlorine being so electronegative is going to pull when it gets close to sodium, pull on this outer electron until it actually steals it away. So now what we need to do is we need to change our stats down here at the bottom of the screen. So because sodium has a loss an electron, it now has not 11, uh, but it actually has 10. And chlorine over here has gained an electron, so it now has 18. So going back to what we talked about with the ions earlier, um, sodium is now, because it has one more proton um, than electrons, it is now a cation and positive, and chlorine, now having gained an extra electron, has more negative electrons than positive protons, and it is an anion. So the ionic bond is going to be formed between the positive charge of the sodium and the negative charge of the chlorine. So it's really just those opposite charges caused by um, the transfer of that electron that is going to create, um, in this case, table salt. So that bond is simply just those, um, the cation positive charge being attracted to the anion's negative charge. So that basically sums up what an ionic bond entails, um, especially as far as biology is concerned. Um, now, when the ionic bond is formed, it does neutralize um, into table salt, so table salt is not charged. However, our bodies are full of a ton um, of ions that are constantly traveling back and forth across the cell membrane. Um, so before moving on to covalent bonds, I do want to give an example of how ions um, travel inside of our cells. Here is an image depicting a very small portion of a cell membrane. Um, as you can probably recall, uh, cell membranes are full of various proteins, like this one, um, that are used for a multitude of purposes. So they could be used, um, in this case, to transport materials in and out of the cell or um, with cell communication. So um, inside of our bodies, we have a lot of ions that are constantly moving back and forth across of our cell membrane. However, um, I do want to note that ions have to move through um, kind of either like active transport or facilitated diffusion. They must move through a protein. Ions cannot diffuse through the center of the cell membrane because of their charge. So what we call um, proteins that transport ions are actually just called ion channels. Um, sometimes they open and close to regulate how many ions they're letting in at certain times. So like for instance, this would be an ion channel. And some commonly used ions um, inside of our bodies that are super important are going to be um, sodium, um, calcium, which is positively charged, both of those, um, potassium, uh, which is also positively charged, and chlorine, which is negatively charged. So all of these ions are um, commonly seen on the AP exam, usually as an example of um, you know, facilitated diffusion or something along those lines, uh, which we'll get into in a later video. So just for now, we're going to keep it simple. Um, just know that because ions are charged, they just can't pass through the hydrophobic middle of the cell membrane where all the fats are. So that really leaves them no choice but to use um, an ion channel. So that's going to sum up ionic bonding and some examples with table salt and ions that move across the cell membrane. Uh, and now we can move on to our covalent bonds. So to start off explaining what a covalent bond is, we can kind of break down what the word covalent actually means. Um, co means together or shared, and valent comes from the concept of the valence electrons. So in this case, um, what all covalent bonds have in common is that they involve the sharing of electrons. So what I'm going to go into next is that there are actually two different types of covalent bonds, um, one being polar covalent and one being nonpolar covalent. And what differs uh, between them is how they share their electrons. Molecules that are held together with polar covalent bonds are going to share their electrons unequally, and with nonpolar covalent bonded molecules, they actually share their electrons completely equal. So a reoccurring theme in biology is going to be that structure is going to impact the function of something. So uh, because polar and nonpolar covalent bonded molecules have that different structure, um, the way that they share their electrons is different, they actually display different characteristics. So polar covalent bonds tend to have a slight charge, um, nonpolar covalent bonds, no charge, very neutral. So I'll start out with giving some examples of a polar covalent bond.
the main and biggest example of a polar covalent molecule is going to be um, the most important molecule in the universe for life, and that is water. Uh, water is very interesting because it is one of the few molecules um, and compounds on Earth that actually is more dense as a liquid than a solid, which we'll get into. Um, we'll do a whole thing with water. So the reason why water is unique is because of oxygen and its six valence electrons. Because oxygen has six valence electrons, it actually is going to have a strong electronegativity, which I have mentioned already, uh, meaning that it's going to pull on electrons um, stronger than other elements because it only needs to to fulfill its octet or its outer um, valence shell. So when water is formed um, in between oxygen and two hydrogens, um, because it is covalent, they do share those electrons, but because oxygen is greedy and it pulls on those electrons so hard, um, they do not share the electrons equally. So as you can see, I've added the two hydrogens in. Um, you can see that hydrogen has one valence electron. Uh, here's one from hydrogen. Here's another one from hydrogen. Um, they are sharing these valence electrons. So oxygen now has a full octet, outer ring. And um, if you remember, the... S orbital only holds two electrons, so hydrogen actually now has a full outer ring as well. Um, so its single ring has the two electrons. So what happens, because the electrons spend more time when they are rotating around, uh, they spend more time by oxygen, it gives oxygen a slightly negative charge because electrons are negative. And because hydrogen is not actually it doesn't have those electrons as often. Um, they're not spending as much time by the hydrogens. It gives them a positive charge. And this is what I mean by um, what makes a polar covalent molecule unique is that polar covalent molecules usually have partial charges um, due to the unequal sharing of electrons. In the case of polar molecules, the more electronegative atom, because electrons are spending more time um, orbiting around the more electronegative atom, it's going to give it that slightly negative charge. And the uh, atom that is not receiving um, the electrons as often is going to have the slightly positive charge. And because of this, um, again, using uh, the cell membrane and transport as an example, um, water cannot pass through the middle of the cell membrane because it's hydrophobic. And uh, polar covalent molecules are always going to be what's called hydrophilic. Hydrophilic also just means water-loving molecules. In this case, water loves itself. Um, there are plenty of other uh, polar covalently bonded um, molecules and compounds that are hydrophilic as well, and they must use uh, a transport protein to travel in and out of the cell, and typically um, on a more macro scale, uh, hydrophilic molecules tend to be like our absorbers, like cotton is very hydrophilic. Um, it absorbs water, things uh, like, like diapers and things are also going to be very absorbent and hydrophilic as well. Let's go ahead and move on to nonpolar covalent molecules, which are going to share their electrons equally. A big example in biology of a nonpolar covalent molecule is going to be um, anything that has a hydrocarbon chain, meaning just a bunch of carbons, hydrogens, uh, which typically make up our fats. As you can see by the looks of this hydrocarbon chain, it's very symmetrical, which is a good indicator that something is going um, to be nonpolar. So fats in this case, because um, they share their electrons equally, they are not going to have any charge. And because these molecules don't have that charge, that's going to give them different properties. Again, it all goes back to if you change the structure of the way something's built, it's going to change the way that it functions. So nonpolar covalent molecules are able to pass through the lipid bilayer, um, given that phospholipids have that those fatty chains. Um, nonpolar covalent molecules can just pass right on through the cell membrane. Because water is charged and nonpolar covalent molecules are not charged, um, that difference between them actually causes them to repel against each other. So, for instance, um, oil and water don't really mix well because oil is fatty and nonpolar, and water is obviously polar, so they just do not mix. So um, that is why the nonpolar covalent molecules have such an easy time going through the nonpolar center of the cell membrane because they're alike. Um, so.
again, it's not just fats that are nonpolar. Um, a lot of hormones like testosterone are nonpolar and can just diffuse through the cell membrane as well. Um, it's important to know that we call molecules that are nonpolar hydrophobic, not water loving at all. Think phobia is like a fear. I'm trying to make some connections early on here to things that we'll be covering in some later units. So the hydrophobic, hydrophilic properties of our nonpolar and polar molecules is something that is never going away. It's going to keep coming back, especially when it comes to cell transport, um, how things pass across the cell membrane. So I'm trying to make those connections. So as far as the nonpolar and polar covalent, uh, the mechanics behind them is important to know that it's due to the how they share their electrons, um, but especially try to remember and make the connection that polar molecules are hydrophilic and water loving, and nonpolar molecules are hydrophobic and don't like water. That is something that is going to be a keystone concept that is going to keep coming back, keep coming back. So, and on that note, you know, let's go ahead and move on to the last bond. I'm going to keep it short and sweet, uh, which is going to be hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen bonds are going to be the weakest bond. Um, ionic and covalent bonds are a lot stronger than hydrogen bonds because a hydrogen bond is simply, uh, it's just defined as the attraction between a hydrogen that's slightly positive and an electronegative atom that is slightly negative. So partial charges. So with ionic bonds, it's sort of like a full-blown charge. A cation has a positive charge and an anion has a, or a negative charge. So with hydrogen bonding, we're dealing with partial charges, which makes for a weaker bond. The biggest example is going to be hydrogen bonding between two water molecules. So here we have three water molecules. Um, if you remember from the polar portion of this video, uh, water does have a partial charge that is due to its polarity. Um, oxygen does hoard those electrons, those negative electrons, making the oxygen region of a water molecule slightly negative and the hydrogen regions of the water molecule slightly positive. So all a hydrogen bond is is going to be a weak bond between these positive and negative charges. Remember, opposites attract. Hydrogen bonds are always going to be indicated by just little dots. So you can see there's going to be a hydrogen bond created here. And of course, water floating around, especially if it's liquid, is going to move. So if this was moving around, it may be this negative region bonds with this positive region, etc. Um, those bonds are kind of constantly breaking and reforming as water flows around inside maybe a glass of uh, or a water bottle or something like that. So, I mean, that's it for the hydrogen bonding. Just know that it's really weak and that it's created between two partial charges. I'm using water as the example here because a lot of water's properties are due to the hydrogen bonding, uh, but I'm going to elaborate on that in the next video.